Good afternoon. I want to welcome you all to a new edition of uh, Fridays with Friedlander. We're going to do something a little bit uh, different today than our usual. Uh, I've asked uh, one of my colleagues and uh, friends uh, and former chair of uh, this department, Dr. Dave Lunsford, to conduct an interview with one of our former faculty members, Dr. Peter Sheptak. Dr. Sheptak is a legend here around uh, our department and our hospital. Uh, he is a wonderful human being, very balanced human being, great doctor, masterful surgeon. There's still great stories that are being told about him. And he really witnessed so much of the history of our department that we wanted to document uh, that uh, for our department. So I've asked, uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Lunsford uh, to conduct uh, this interview. This is a pre-recorded uh, interview, and I'm sure it's going to be a gem of what is uh, maintained in our archives. So I thank him very much and enjoy this interview. Hi, my name is Dade Lunsford. I'm a member, I would guess you say, of the senior faculty at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and the University of Pittsburgh. And today we're doing something a little bit different. Um, we're going to have a fireside chat with a very old friend and somebody who was a mentor and a, a co-faculty member and now um, a uh, teacher f still for our residents and uh, still for myself over now some 45 years. So we're going to talk with uh, Peter Sheptek, who served for many years as clinical professor of neurological surgery here at Pitt. And uh, I first ran into Dr. Sheptek uh, when I came here in 1975 as a uh, newly starting resident. I immediately recognized somebody with tremendous surgical expertise, somebody with enormous clinical judgment, and somebody who could be a wonderful role model for not only myself, but for countless others that he has helped to train over the last 45 years. So, um, Peter, um, thanks for doing this. Um, My pleasure. Glad that you could yeah. uh, participate in this. I think that you have a lot to teach all of us about what you did, um, how you did it, uh, and um, let's go ahead and get started. So, you're a local guy in a way. Uh, born in Butler, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Butler, Pennsylvania. It's about 30 miles north of Pittsburgh. Right. And you were an only child. Only child. That's me. And uh, you went to high school in Butler? Butler High School, yes. And then to Notre Dame. How did that happen? Well, uh, I was always interested uh, uh, in Notre Dame, uh, but I also was interested uh, in the Naval Academy. I had an appointment there as well. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to be a jet pilot. And then uh, Notre Dame came up. Uh, I was interested in sports as well with, with football and track and uh, ended up going to Notre Dame and uh, had a wonderful time there. And at Notre Dame you obviously decided you wanted to go into medicine at some point. Yes. And you began the process of looking around for which school. Yes. Well, we uh, uh, we did uh, uh, have a situation where I was in pre-med initially, and uh, I had questions after, after the part of the first year because of some sports activities. I had a midterm problem with chemistry, and I says, my God, maybe I'm really not ready. Maybe to, you should have been a jet pilot. Maybe I should have been a jet pilot, but anyhow. Uh, we, we got over that, and then I proceeded to have a nice, nice academic career at Notre Dame, and uh, 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 elected to go off uh, to medical school. And uh, I applied to various places and uh, uh, had acceptances at uh, Pitt and uh, Georgetown and Michigan and uh, uh, Loyola of Chicago, and uh, play, uh, so. Uh, I elected to end up at Pitt. It was close enough to home, and uh, Pitt had just uh, built Scaife Hall then, mm -hmm. and uh, 
uh, it was a brand new medical school, basically, so I ended up in Pittsburgh. And at some point you decided you wanted to be a surgeon, uh, but it, as I understand it back then, it wasn't clear what surgical specialty you were going to focus on. No, uh, I think I always had a surgical personality, uh, and uh, there was no doubt that I wanted to go into some type of surgery after medical school. So it was during my internship, which was a surgical in internship, I was in uh, Hank Bonson's first internship group. Right, so Hank had just come from Hopkins, Hopkins right? Correct. And become the, the first, or the new surgical chair at, at uh, Pitt. Yes, that's correct. And in those days, we rotated through all the surgical specialties. And uh, uh, I was contemplating between plastics, orthopedics, and neuro. And uh, I think my experience in neurosurgery uh, during my rotation and my internship uh, and, uh, said, this is it, this is what I want to do. So at, at that time, um, neurosurgery was a section. Hank it, was the department chair for surgery. And who was the uh, uh, neurosurgical chief? Neurosurgical chief at that time was Dr. Stuart Rao, mm -hmm. who uh, was trained by uh, 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 Frazier. Frazier at the Penn, uh, who was trained by Cushing. And uh, so he was a grandson of Harvey Cushing, and uh, there were other people in the program at that time. Uh, uh, Jerry Grunigal was trained by Max Pete at Michigan, mm -hmm. and uh, Tony Susan was trained at the Brigham and Harvard, uh, and uh, Hugh Rosamoff uh, was also in, on the faculty at that time. So. Uh, after rotating through neurosurgery during my internship uh, at that time, we uh, 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 had a great time, and uh, I, I elected to just to go into neurosurgery. Right, and so um, this decision was made while being an intern, and Hank Bonson signed off on it, obviously. And yes, that's correct. Stuart Rao uh, was, I'm sure, enthusiastic about it. Um, but there were some uh, the other players that you mentioned. For example, Rosamoff went on to, to work at the VA. Right, um, that's correct. Sometime, and then I guess he went to um, Einstein for a he while. Went, after uh, that. Well, actually, he left. Uh, he left Pittsburgh in, uh, approximately in. Uh, I guess it was probably uh, sixty-five, sixty-six, uh, to go to. Uh, uh, Albert Einstein in New York. Right. Uh, we had Sidney Goldring here in the uh, uh, early 60s as well for three years. He came from St. Louis, Barnes. Right. And uh, uh, after after uh, Sidney, uh, Tony Susan became chief. Uh, by then, Rosamoff was gone. And then uh, Peter Genetti came in 1971. Right. And Stuart Rowell um, was clinically active until how how long do you I, I met him in 1975 when I first came here right he remained clinically active probably I would say till the early 70s but he was not participating in any administrative duties right I mean uh, he would bring in cases where the residents might assist him but and he was still, uh, you know, coming into conferences and things. Right. And then um, when Sidney Goldring left, he actually went back to uh, uh, Wash U. Yes, that's correct. Um, at that point. And then Peter Janetta, as you said, came here in 1971 and had negotiated with Hank Bonson to uh, create a separate department. Um, at uh, at that time. Um, now, I, I want to go back a little bit to the apocryphal story about how Stuart Rao got here, uh, because it's it's been rumored that he uh, and uh, uh, Gardner uh, trained with Frazier in Philadelphia, and uh, they were told to go west, young man, um, and they uh, had a coin toss as to who got Cleveland uh, and who got Pittsburgh. Is there some truth in that story? Yes, I believe there was because uh, Dr. R uh, Stuart Robb told me about that too as well. It always brought on a laugh because uh, Bill Gardner ended up at the Cleveland Clinic and uh, 
Stewart uh, stayed here in Pittsburgh, and right. uh, so he was here from about 46, 47 on. Uh, and then Tony Susan joined him at a later right. date. So at the time you were here, there was an internship, and then there was four years of neurosurgical training. Is that Correct. Right? Correct. Um, and um, at that time, neurosurgery wasn't as we do a lot of it now, where we have a lot of subspecialty focus. I mean, you covered the gamut of neurosurgery, right? Well, basically, early on in training, we were still operating in the middle age of the Cushing era, uh, I guess we could call it, because uh, we all used hand tools uh, to uh, make burr holes, uh, jiggly saws to do cr uh, craniotomies. Uh, we had uh, no magnification, no, no uh, good lighting except for headlights and lighted retractors. Uh, diagnostic uh, studies included uh, carotid angiograms, vertebral angiograms, myelograms, mm -hmm. ventriculograms. And, and the resident the, did a lot of those residents, studies. The, the neurosurgical residents did all those right. as part of the, usually the second year of his rotation. He was assigned to, uh, to radiology to perform all these procedures. The radiologists didn't do those at all. Right. Now, as I recall, you told me there was one dark moment when you were trying to make this decision to go into neurosurgery when you had to uh, assist in a, a acoustic uh, tumor resection. Oh yes, that was back my uh, senior year in medical school. We were uh, rotating through Mercy Hospital and Dr. George Gray, who was a neurosurgeon at Mercy, was doing a, a large acoustic tumor in a sitting position. And the job of the uh, medical student at that time was to hold a handheld retractor under the cerebellar hemisphere. Until you passed out. It was, it was about seven, eight hours, I remember. And uh, occasionally I had a little bit of a break, but I think my arm and shoulder were so tired and sore after that for about a week. And I said, if this is what neurosurgery is, I'm not sure I want to go into this. <laughs> Fortunately, it has evolved. I mean, at that time, um, uh, the finger was an important dissector for tumors, right? Oh, yes, right? yes. We'd, we'd get a big meningioma, and Dr. Brower and Dr. Susan, once they established the, uh, uh, the plane of the tumor from the peel surface of the brain, uh, 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 using, of course, uh, uh, a monopolar bovi unit to touch forceps. Mm -hmm. We had no bipolar coagulation right. back then. And uh, uh, if it got to a certain point where they could actually put their finger around the whole tumor and deliver it with the, with the finger thrust. Yep. And I remember big meningiomas coming out that way. Uh, now these were on the surface. These weren't uh, right, deep-seated uh, deep meningiomas attached to the carotid artery or the arteries or nerves, cranial nerves. But uh, that was uh, always great to deliver the meningioma. Very exciting. Oh Just yes. Just like taking that final disc fragment out of the inner space, right? You got to save that for the attending physician. That's right. So to show the show of the big disc you pulled out. That, yeah, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, even though it was very clinically focused, obviously in your training, there still was a period of time when you were able to do uh, some um, important research. Yes, that's true. I had a. A year off under Sidney Goldring, I had an NIH postdoctoral fellowship that uh, fortunately paid $10,000, which was a lot of money in those money. days, because I think my salary as a resident at that time was like $3,000. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we uh, were able to, uh, uh, my wife and I were able to afford a, a, a refrigerator and a washer and dryer that year. Of course, I have to say I did some uh, moonlighting as well, yes, which wasn't supposed to be done. But uh, so you were one of the pioneers um, in actually endovascular uh, types of things. Uh, uh, Paul Zanetti, another one of the residents, had been working on some aneurysm occlusion methods. Yes, that's correct. He, uh, Paul, uh, dur during his year, but uh, his lab year, uh, worked on uh, the application of. Uh, uh, vascular adhesives, basically bucrylate, mm -hmm. to uh, occlude blood vessels. And he d 
did a program where he uh, developed uh, uh, aneurysms in dogs using venous pouches and then basically obliterating them both with a needle injection mm -hmm. to the dome or through a catheter. And uh, that, that set the pace for Chuck Kerber, who was a, a young uh, neuroradiologist here, uh, to develop uh, uh, the catheterization methods for AVMs. We initially started for mm -hmm. AVMs right. and obliterating AVMs with uh, bucrylate. Uh, and then after that, uh, we, we decided to try uh, directly injecting aneurysms with the bucrylate, especially certain aneurysms with broad-based broad necks or some anatomical peculiarities uh, where it might be difficult to put a a clip on with the clips we had available right. at that time. And we did a series of uh, uh, injections of uh, tissue adhesive into aneurysms. Yeah, so just to put it into perspective, this is uh, some 55, 60 years before what we're doing now where that's a big focus of yes, yes. the practice of neurosurgery. Yes, yes. But when you were in training, this was a before the microscope, right? Yes. And. Uh, Peter Jeanette obviously was a pioneer working with microscope, and that came in in, in uh, 1971 when he when he started. And of course, microscopes have improved a lot, but not all of neurosurgery was taught during your residency program. So I remember you told me once, I said, well, what about transphenoidal surgery? Because when I was a resident, I did transphenoidal surgery with you, but how did that get started here? Well, uh, transphenoidal surgery became a apparent in the mid-70s. Mid and uh, before that, we had to do open craniotomies uh, and so forth. And uh, Joe Maroon came here at that time uh, as well. And he had tr uh, done some training in Vermont mm -hmm. Uh, with uh, microvascular procedures, including transphenoidal surgery. And so basically, uh, uh, I talked to Joe. Uh, he had some questions about some aspects of spinal surgery, which I did quite a bit of then. And uh, so we just sort of traded thoughts and uh, uh, techniques, technical things. And my first few transphenoidals uh, I did with, with, with him. Right, and then uh, you know, once I got the expertise down and, and figured things out, uh, yeah, they they went rather smoothly. So, so I, I, going back to when you were training and afterwards, also there was another faculty member here we haven't discussed named Koskoff, um, and uh, he was a true, I guess, neuropsychiatrist in the sense that yes, he was. He, he yes. was a psychiatrist who did some neurosurgery, and so he he came to being, I guess, during the development of things that Freeman and Watts did was uh, with doing lobotomy. Yes, that's um, correct. And uh, you have participated in a couple of those procedures yes. with him? Yeah, we, there was a small operating room at uh, Western Psych. And uh, uh, these were patients with chronic schizophrenia or chronic depression mm -hmm. and, or other you know, uh, type of uh, psychiatric problems. and. Uh, uh, Dr. Koskoff would do the measurements on the skull from uh, the area of looking at the head, uh, make some small incisions for the burr holes, put the burr holes in, <coughs> and uh, there was a leucotome, maybe uh, you know four or five inches long, uh, that he had a pre-described uh, uh, depth, mm -hmm. and he would put it in and wave wave the leucotome and do some of the frontal lobe uh, central uh, white white fibers right. on both sides and uh, uh, I, I didn't do that much follow up in the patients uh, but but he did uh, and I actually did a, a, a few of those myself uh, in the early years of mm -hmm. my practice and uh, they, the, the ones I did were mostly for chronic pain mm -hmm. and uh, Cancer pain, primarily, and uh, they they help some. Yeah, yeah. So, you were obviously and always known as a, a consummate surgeon. That is, somebody who had a gift. So, wh what do you, what do you think are the ingredients that make up a um, 
uh, not just a good neurosurgeon, but a, a really good neurosurgeon? Well, I, I think first of all, you have to have hand-eye coordination with right. with the with your, your fingers. So, what what do you what did you ask resident applicants to help figure that well, out? Well, I I interviewed a large number of resident applicants over the years, and part of the, my interview process was always to ask them what hobbies they might yeah, have right. to utilize their fingers and hands, uh, because. As neurosurgeons, if we educate neurosurgeons, we have to educate them, first of all, to be surgeons. Now, we all realize that everybody has, has different traits of expertise mm -hmm. with their hand, but it doesn't mean you can't function as a, as a good neurosurgeon and get good results, even though uh, one may have some problems at times. But, the, the big thing to educate the residents with this is to give them confidence in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And some surgeons may take an hour to do a procedure, some may take two and a half hours. But the important thing is that it's done safely, with good technique, and the results are good. Right. I think there's one, uh, several other aspects. We talked a little bit about this once before, but I'll give you an example of an experience I had with you um, in which I think it shows the one of these features of, that's needed to f function well as a neurosurgeon. Uh, uh, I was doing an aneurysm uh, with you. Uh, I had done the craniotomy and opened things like that up. And uh, you were always very good in sort of letting the surgeon move to a level where both you felt he was competent and you were con confident that he, he could carry on to the next step. So you were scrubbing in the outside room um, and uh, I had the aneurysm um, um, exposed and I was picking out a clip from this and just as you walked into the room, the operating room, this is OR8, the old room, the aneurysm went <laughs> and that's a dark moment for everybody, especially the patient but as the resident. And just as that happened, this jet of blood went up, and you turned to me and said, what's up, sport? So the point of this was that equanimity among a surgeon's skills is one of the most important things. And you had the equanimity to not go ballistic with the fact that this rupture had, because these things happen, but and not because I think I was doing something totally incompetent, but. Uh, the other thing that uh, was great about you as a mentor was you instilled confidence in the resident that if the resident screwed up, you could get him out of trouble. And for a resident to grow, you got to take some chances, but you still got to know that there's somebody who's senior who knows what they're doing, who can take care of a problem if it happens or if you create it. Right, and this is something I always try to instill in residents. You're right, I would let them go along in a procedure as long as I felt comfortable, right. and they felt comfortable, yep. because their comfort was was important. Right. And uh, yes, over the years training a lot of residents, they got into situations sometimes that were tough. And I think that the, it's the responsibility of the attending neurosurgeon to be there to help them bail out right. and to show them how to get out of trouble. So we always tried to teach the residents how important it was in developing technique and approaching a problem to be able to run, run into a situation that you can take care of, to use good judgment. Right. But then if, if, if the crap hits the fan, how to get out of trouble. Yep. And getting out of trouble is something you can only learn by visualizing how it's done and participating in it with your own hands. Right. So this is uh, what I, I feel is important in training a resident. Uh, and uh, this is what, what I always tried to do. And uh, sure, I think all, all, all surgeons lose their temper in the operating rooms occasionally especially if something doesn't work or they don't get the instrument they want. But I never, I never 
came down on a on a resident who developed a situation that needed fixed right. uh, by bawling him out or belittling him or uh, offending intimidating him. them. Yeah, it, it it just doesn't work, and I think this is a good, the best way to build up confidence in right. teaching. So one of the other things that's obviously important in all of us in the field that we're involved in is a certain level of r resilience. So although I'm sure it was pretty rare, when something bad happened in a patient of yours um, or a case went wrong or outcome wasn't what you wanted, how did, how did, how did you get through that? Well, uh, it was difficult. Uh, I wasn't the type of man that went and spoke to a lot of people about what transpired during a case maybe because mm -hmm. I just sort of kept things to myself. I mean, I'm, I might have gone home and, and, and to talk to my wife and said, gee, this was really a tough day and this may have happened. But I, I thought about the case and what I could have done differently. Uh, but sometimes that's out of your hands. You do what you think you have to do, but then stuff happens. Like if somebody goes into severe spasm after an aneurysm right. clipping that went very well and the patient ends, ends up infarcting out. Uh, and I would, I would really think deeply about that, and especially when you sit there and talk to the family afterwards. Uh, but again, I know I had cases to do the next day and it's, it's similar to putting a bad loss in a football game out of your system and going to the next game and giving, Learn something and move give, on. giving all you can to the patient that you're going to do the next day. Right. Um, so I was, I'm going to go back just the story of you were thinking maybe you were going to be a fighter pilot um, versus a neurosurgeon. I mean, these are taxing, important, um, and perhaps stressful t types of, uh, of uh, jobs. Um, are neurosurgeons sort of wild men? They can be. Uh, I don't think we're wild in the sense we take unnecessary chances with things. You can't do that in a surgical case. What did you do as a wild uh, thing? You used to drive cars. Well, I used to like fast cars, yep. yes. Uh, I had uh, Porsches, Maserati. Uh, I raced Formula Fords for a little while. But I always enjoyed speed, right. much to my wife's chagrin because she didn't like to be my co-pilot when I went too fast. But uh, it was fun. It was a nice outlet for me. And uh, I, I really enjoyed, enjoyed that. I'm reminded of a story of a bit of a crazy adventure that you had many years ago during a reunion with your, uh, um, your partner and prior teacher, Tony Susan. And you went down to the Chesapeake Bay for an, uh, uh, an event. Oh, that was, those were the days. We always had these reunions every summer, people who finished training with Tony Susan in my era. And we always went sailing and, and boating, and we went out on this boat uh, on a June 21st, the summer solstice, and mm -hmm. uh, we were cruising along in the Chesapeake when we suddenly hit a, a fish trap. There was a collection of vertical poles, like small telephone poles, with a net strung between them that eventually ended in a dead end to catch the fish. They were supposed to have navigation lights on on the uh, trap, but they didn't. So we ran into the trap, and one of the poles came up to the front of the boat, and we immediately started to sink. Shorted the battery out, which killed the radio because this was pre-cell phone days. And uh, so we spent the night in water on the Chesapeake clinging to uh, fishnet and these poles, stripping jellyfish off of us all night long. And uh, the shore was only three or four miles away, but we had no way to get there. So finally, a, a fishing boat came out in the morning, manned by one of the local Chesapeake people. And, and found these four neurosurgeons stuck found, on found, the water. There were six of us <laughs> total. I mean, it was, uh, it was an interesting evening. Yeah. And somehow, after that experience, three putting a green didn't bother me as much. 
<laughs> exactly. So it's something that gave you a vision of life and yes, and exactly. Thing. So um, sometimes uh, work-life balance is a problem in our profession, right? And yet you've been married next year, sixty years. Sixty years. Um, and how did your wife learn to tolerate your lifestyle? It was difficult at times. Yeah. Uh, I think the amount of workload we had was really, really heavy with with a lot of uh, dinners being missed and things like that. And uh, uh, sometimes I think uh, we like to expend more time maybe with some of the extracurricular activities with golf and stuff like that, mm -hmm. that maybe I should have spent more time with, with, with people at home. But again, it's, it's, it's tough to weigh what happens in each individual's right. life as they go on. Well, in addition to your skills as a surgeon, you've, you've been a lifelong golfer. Yes, um, yes. It's been an important part of your life. Um, you were an, a member of the Penguins medical team for a very long period long of time. Long time, yes. I started with the Penguins as their neurosurgical consultant mm -hmm. in the mid-70s and just basically uh, totally retired about uh, uh, seven, eight years ago. All right. Um, and more recently, maybe it was something you started when you were younger, uh, I've, I've seen a number of, uh, of your pieces of your artwork. Yes, I like to paint. I, I do acrylics. And uh, I painted some in high school and at Notre Dame. And uh, uh, used to illustrate some cases occasionally early on. Uh, with, with drawings, but uh, I started in earnest uh, once uh, once I retired, I took up painting again. Uh, my dear wife sometimes has problems with my volume of paintings, knowing what to do with them. You need to because, have a show. Because they don't necessarily fit her decor, you see, yeah. so, but uh, we, we work it out. Yeah. So uh, I give some, some of my paintings to the kids and things, but right. I could sit down and relax for three, four hours and makes all the difference in the world. So one of the, as we get older as surgeons, I'm not gonna tell you that I'm getting older, but we have to make a decision at what point should we pass the baton on in terms of others doing surgery? Did you have any insight into that? Well, that's a highly personal uh, situation with each person, I think. Uh, I, with my decision at 66, I felt I still had the uh, uh, technical expertise to right. continue doing what I was doing. And I could have functioned quite easily till, till into my 70s without a question. Uh, but uh, I, th I think the biggest problem I, that came up with me was attention span sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, because as I got older, I wanted to spend more time uh, in Hilton Head you know, because uh, we've had a place down there since the early 70s. And uh, it was tough at times, you know, doing a six, seven hour case. Yep. Uh, not technically, but just attention span, especially maybe in, in teaching right. properly throughout a case. So I figured, well, look, I, I think I'm just going to, and you can't half retire. You can't retire and do two or three cases. Yep a week because unfortunately your malpractice insurance and everything else is the same whether you do one case right. or 600 cases right. a year. Uh, so you just got to make that decision right. and uh, uh, talking with my family we, we decided it was time to do it and right. uh, it's been good because we spent half the year in Hilton Head and half the year in Pittsburgh now. So we're going to wind up uh, um, the discussion a little bit but do you have any additional insights or final thoughts or things that you can give to the viewers and to the residents in the future who will maybe yeah, take a look at this? I think uh, the, the important things are you have to uh, uh, realize what your family does for you during your residency and your training, uh, the trust you've had with your colleagues, uh, the residents you've trained, uh, uh, being part of their training was very important to me. And uh, 
the other uh, situation is the patients, mm -hmm. because uh, without patients, we can't function. And I think the important thing with that is to treat your patients with respect, do the right surgery for the right indications, and uh, realize when you do a fantastic case and get a good result, just think how good the patient mm -hmm. feels. Thanks, I think it's a great um, final conclusion uh, for our discussion. There's been no fire here at the fireside chat, but I think it's a well, it was a, nice. a great uh, summary of, uh, of what you went through, the transitions that yeah, we've all yeah. gone over these uh, years. And right. I'm sure the uh, people who watch this in the future will be uh, um, educated further as you've been educating for 55, 60 years now. Well, I enjoyed coming back, and uh, it'll be good to continue seeing you on the yeah. golf course. Well, I have to improve before you're going to see much more <laughs> of me there. So thanks very much, Peter. Thanks. Great. Okay. Really enjoyed it. Yep, it was good.